Kemi, for being our guest. You're most welcome, Nadia. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks. Femi Olayebi, you're a self-taught handbag designer, a trainer, a mentor, and the chief creative director of Femi Handbags brand, an eponymous line of leather handbags and accessories. You're also the founder of the Lagos Leather Fair, a retail networking platform that you created in 2017 to promote the work of leather designers in Nigeria and beyond, and create awareness of the industry, the, of the value within your industry. You are renowned for your unique color-drenched pieces. Femi, you greatly influenced the production of every Femi handbag piece, and you continue to directly manage your facility in Ibadan, Nigeria. You have received several awards, and a few years ago, your business became a case study for MBA students at the prestigious Lagos Business School. Today, dear friends, we are going to hear the story of this amazing lady that I admire so much. So, Femi, what is your story? Thank you, Nadia. Thank you so much for um, inviting me um, to your amazing IG lives. I'm glad to be a part of it. And I must say, this is my first IG life, so I don't know how you managed to crack that, but you did. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I, I, I would just go straight into it. Um, so I would, I would say that my story started um, about 29 years ago when I made a diaper bag for my first baby. Um, I had just come back from France at the time. I had gone to study a, a master's in translation. And I came back, um, but couldn't find the kind of job I wanted. Um, and then there I was, an, a, a happy, excited, expectant mom. So what did I do? Um, I went baby shopping for um, baby things. And when I tried to get a baby bag, a diaper bag, I couldn't find one I liked or could afford. So, of course, I have this never, do, ne um, never die spirit. So... Mm -hmm. The first thing I decided to do was, well, why don't you just make your own? So I decided to make my own. I went right back to the uh, market and um, got some pretty fabric. And I proceeded to make, to cut and sew a bag. And that, that is now the very first bag that I ever made. Um, so uh, a, a lot has happened since that first bag. Um, um, I, I then started receiving orders unexpectedly. And um, because I had, of course, grown up with conservative parents, I'd been raised by uh, conservative parents, Bus doing a business or running a business was definitely not in the books at all. So it was very alien to me. Um, but somehow I managed to start learning um, a lot because I, I was enjoying the process and I started to learn a lot about, um, about making handbags. And then I started to hire tailors. And I had the first and the second and the third, and it just went on and on and on like that. And what I would do is I would read a lot about how to make handbags, and then I would teach the tailors. They were dressmakers, um, practically. And then I would teach the tailors everything that I had, um, I had taught myself. And so that, that, so the story continued from there, and um, it's, it's incredible. But in hindsight, I now realize that um, making that baby bag was just a piece of, a puzzle that God was just slowly putting together, a puzzle of my life. You know, I, I could never have realized what would be happening so many years um, after that. Um, but of course, I had a lot to learn. I learned very slowly. Um, I always call myself a late bloomer. And um, um, I just started teaching myself everything that I could just to get better and better at this. Um, a lot has happened since then. Um, and um, I, would, I, would very, I would say that the experiences that I have gone through, the, no textbook really, and the lessons I have learned, no textbook can, can teach. Also, you know, um, 
I don't want to go into the middle part because it's, it's, it's been 29 years of that middle part. But in that time, I've done a lot. Um, I managed to go to business school. I, I ended up um, acquiring the business education that I really needed. Um, I also had the opportunity of attending a design school uh, a few years ago. Finally went to Milan to study handbag construction and um, design. I have also um, been able to attend lots of um, international exhibitions. I've taken part in many exhibitions, both locally and internationally. I have had the opportunity of um, meeting the most amazing people. And I feel very blessed and thankful of which you and Jill are <laughs> a couple of them. Um, and people who have helped to shape my entrepreneurial journey, if I, if I can call it that. Um, I've also had the opportunity of uh, attending all expenses paid mentoring programs in the UK, in, in the US, and got the opportunity to travel to places I ordinarily would not have gone to, um, mm -hmm. Brazil, New Mexico, but my bags have taken me to so many places. And it, it, it's, it's really quite uh, fast, fascinating. And um, so, uh, and I, I also opened a flagship in Lagos. I'm just trying to remember all the things I've done in all those years, but just so many things. And but I think that one of my proudest achievements would probably be, would probably be um, having my business made a, a, a case study at the Lagos Business School. For me, that was a really big deal. And um, I remember 10 years later, I was actually invited to back to business school to come and talk about the evolution and how I had evolved from the time I had gone for my course to that time. So that was interesting. I guess the other proudest, proud moment for me would... Uh, would be uh, um, the fact that we signed a partnership with the MasterCard Foundation um, last year. It's a, an NGO that is based in, in Canada. And Nadia and Jill, you know all about that. <laughs> and, um, and the idea was to, um, so we, we signed a partnership which involves a pro project that involves um, uh, produce the production of PPE, 2.5 million pieces of PPE. And we've been distributing PPE um, over five states here in Nigeria. So my story is, I, I would say my story is one of possibilities because the possibilities are all around us. And that's what I saw. Um, and I think all we need to do is to just reach out and catch, catch those possibilities. And um, I, I, I absolutely love making handbags, but I think that now it's gone, it's gone way beyond handbags. Uh, it's a story that shows that persevering at whatever you do has, does have its rewards. Wow. So a story of possibilities and persevering. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful yeah. story, Femi. <laughs> when I think of you, the following words come to my mind. Creativity, rainbow colors, excellence, and quality. What makes Femi handbags so unique and appealing? So I think it's a combination, and I say this with all humility, because I also love my bags. Um, I think it's a combination of many things. It's um, the vibrant colors that are displayed on each and every piece. It's the craftsmanship, the level of craftsmanship. It's the, the fact that they're very well made. Um, and then it's, it's also the, the entire package, the packaging. It's the infusion of the ashoki. Um, the ashoki is the, is the hand-woven fabric that is woven by um, Yorubas in Southwest Africa. I mean, Southwest Nigeria, sorry. Um, it, it's, all, it's all that. It's, um, and I, th I think that w when you experience, when you, when, when you um, encounter our bags, there, there's, something that, there's something about them that, that, that tells that there's been a lot of effort that's gone into, into them, a lot of craftsmanship and a lot of thought um, has, gone, has gone into them. So it's, for me, it's like uh, an, an experience. And um, so whether it's a supersized tote or a mini bag, the bags are saying the same, they're telling the same story all the time. Uh, they, they, they're saying, I'm bold, I'm, I'm chic, I'm, I dare to dare. I can, I can stand tall, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm brave, courageous, I can carry these bags, you know. Um, so I, I think they're, they're saying, and, I, and more than anything else, I stand out. And then I also think to cap everything is the quality, really is the quality. Excellence, I would say, is our mantra. And we've stuck by that all these years. I have to say, I was lucky enough with Gilles to visit your factory in Ibadan. And 
I was like a child in a candy shop looking at all these bags, but also <laughs> in total awe of seeing how meticulously, you know, your, your workers were, you know, making, manufacturing these bags. Mm. So what can I say? Excellence, definitely, I've seen it with my own eyes. Now, who are the Femi handbag target clients? And what is your product range and how do you market those products? Um, so our, our target clients range, well, we have both male and female clients. Um, I would say aged between 30 and 65. And um, they have great taste, if I were to describe them. Good taste, discerning. Um, they have a good eye for quality. So they recognize and appreciate quality when they see one. The, they're, the, they're the kind of people that can afford the international brands. So buying an FH, it's not a problem for them at all. So they're ready to, so the, our client is ready to pay a premium for something that is well-made and something that they, they, they actually believe in. Um, and of course, um, out, outside of that, the, um, so, so those, those are our clients. Our, our products range from, so we have a range of products. Um, so we have mini bags, chic, sophisticated mini bags. Um, then we also have a range of midi-sized bags that we sort of are targeted towards the corporate woman. Um, we have uh, super-sized bags. We have tote bags, shoulder bags, and just a range of uh, extraordinary pieces. Um, but they're all sort of streamlined because over the years we have sort of uh, recognize our hero products and so we we continue to um, work on those you know um and then so there, there's some bags that can swing from day to weekend and we're hoping soon to that we will be um expanding our our line very soon hopefully um and then we also have we also have we, we created a men's line sometime last year and the men's line includes um, weekenders, briefcases, laptop bags, um, smaller, smaller items like phone pouches, uh, um, wash bags, and, and so on. And of course, we also, apart from the men's line, we also do make um, small leather goods. So we have key rings, um, again, phone pouches, and, and a range of small, small goods. So there's really something for, for everyone. Um, in terms of how we sell, um, so uh, we have, we have ex experience has taught us a lot of lessons and even more so since COVID. And we have found that selling online is the most beneficial way of um, selling an FH. Um, and that, that is because, um, we don't, we don't keep inventory. Um, and so we, we sort of sell on a, on a pre order basis. We, so we sell on our, Instagram, we sell from our website, and what we've done over the past few months is to sort of strengthen our our uh, digital footprint because that's just that's that's just the way to go. Uh, we also have a flagship store in Ikui, and that's the only brick and mortar store where we sell right now. Apart from a store, we also have a store a store through which we sell our our bags in New York. But otherwise, most bags are sold online. All our bags are sold online. And, um, and uh, we've sort of found that this direct-to-customer D2C model works better for us. It's, 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 it's just the most practical thing to do until such a time that we can increase our capacity, our production capacity. That just works. Um, and then we also have partnerships. We've created partnerships, established partnerships with um, other online stores. So we sell through Industry Africa. We sell through Itaki Paris. Uh, and we also sell through um, an online store called um, called View. So right now, basically, what we're trying to do with with our marketing is trying to create different um, strategies. So we want to create an Africa strategy. We want to create a Europe strategy. We want to create a US strategy because what this really obtains in one one part of the world does not um, obtain in the other. You know. So so for now, that's that's it. And and we seem to be doing quite good. <laughs> I think you're doing quite good. I quite like the idea that, you know, you're, it's, this is not mass production. Your handbags are literally made to measure, you know, when we yeah. order. And I like the fact that 
you never have two bags that are the same. So once I have mine, it's mine. And yep. someone else will order the same style, but there's always something that differ differentiates the bags. And I think that's absolutely awesome. Now, why did you start the Lagos Leather Fair? Can you tell us more about this adventure? <laughs> Yeah, that's an, uh, quite an adventure. <laughs> I could write a book or volumes on that. Um, okay, so in 2017, um, I created this platform called the Lagos Leather Fair, LLF for short. And um, the reason was this. I had been playing in that space, in that industry for quite a while. And I realized that there were many challenges that we're facing, I, I, it, 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 it was, I think, painful to, to see that those who had started maybe six months before myself or a couple of years before myself were going through the, exactly the same, uh, the same challenges. You know? So I, felt, I just felt this urge. I felt a certain responsibility. I felt I had to do something because I, I probably was one of the longest playing in that, in the, in that field. So I decided that um, one of the ways in which we could begin to change that narrative, one of the ways in which we could begin to um, um, shine a light on the industry, shine a light on the challenges and all the problems would be to create this platform. And the idea of the platform was um, to sort of bring together the players along that value chain. Also, it was important to show that there was so much that could happen along that value chain and that you did not necessarily need to be a designer. You did not necessarily need to be, um, you, you could be so many things, you know, from uh, the value chain is huge, is extensive from the tannery, from the raw materials to the finished product. So there was not enough people in marketing. There was not enough people in product photography. There was just, there were just so many gaps to fill. And then we were all working in silos. And I just felt that, Building a community was the only way that um, our voices could be heard. So I created, um, I created this, um, this platform. And really, some of the challenges were, I mean, three immediately are um, a lack of raw materials. In, in spite of the fact that um, we have functioning tanneries in Kano, we still did not have enough materials to cater to the local, local um, player, local designer like myself. So that was a huge problem. And then um, there was also, we never found, I never found very good quality hardware. So I always had to bring my quality, my hardware in from abroad and that was expensive. But then again, I, I have gotten to the stage where um, our clients are ready to pay for, for that. But I think the biggest, the biggest challenge of all was actually finding artisans who had the right skill sets mm -hmm. to actually manufacture. You know, so um, we all had those problems. You know, we were all still, you know, a lot of people were still beating a path to um, a, um, the art market in Lekki, you know, trying to find uh, artisans to, to manufacture their work. And it just, there was just, there was just no structure around the, around the, um, this ecosystem. And I felt that it was time to do something. We were all talking along. We were all, we were all doing the same thing. Nobody was doing anything about it. And I felt, actually felt that it would be wrong of me to not, to not do something about it. So, um, yeah, so I started that, brought together the players. It was, it was an incredible experience. And um, this is our fifth year. Um, there have been milestones. And, um, and we're hoping that this fifth year, we will be able to, everything will sort of culminate and we'll be able to launch two or three initiatives, you know, to the benefit of the leather, the, the leather designers um, as a whole. So that's it. And, and another thing I, I'm hoping at the end of the, if, and at the end of this all, that as Africans, we can also begin to build strong brands because what we do, we do concentrate on building products and we do, we do not build enough brands. And I think that that, that is something that each and every one of us as designers, as creatives, as, as creative entrepreneurs need to really work, work on. So yeah, that's, that's the, um, that's the LLF story. Last year, um, because of COVID, of course, we, we went ahead. Um, I think I was the only one that didn't quite believe in it, you know, and probably I have, I have a, an, an amazing young team, uh, working with me. And, um, they all said, you know what, we've got to do this. We can, we can have a fair. It can be digital. And I looked at them like, what are they talking about? Of course, we can't do a digital one. <laughs> but then, 
We did, and we pulled it off, you know, beautifully too. And um, I'm proud to say that um, it was actually one of the best. We got we got amazing reviews, and um, we we got um, reports saying that it was one of the best they had watched yet. Well, I have to say, I attended that virtual Lego Sled Affair, and I absolutely loved it. And, Thank you. You know, not only are you such a generous person, you're very innovative, and you carry everybody along with you, which is rare, and it's fantastic. And, you know, I really respect you for that. Thank you. <laughs> I want to ask you this question. Where do you get your inspiration from? Who inspires you? Um, so, I think that it's always a difficult question to answer, but very simply put, I think I'm inspired by just about everything around me. You know, I'm inspired by lovely things. I'm inspired by art. I'm inspired by beautiful spaces. Um, I'm inspired by um, work, um, beautiful work that people have put out there. Um, so basically, I think it's just been loving, loving um, beautiful pieces, you know, and being drawn to um, pieces that are unusual, that are that are different, you know. Of course, I'm obsessed by color as, as my word. <laughs> my work tells the tale all the time. Um, um, but I think more than anything else, I'm inspired by the fact that I can, I can conceptualize something in my head, you know, then draw it on paper and then transform, and then it, become, it becomes transformed into this beautiful piece of art. So again, I go back to the love of art, you know. So, so yeah, I think, I, I think that that's, that's it. In terms of um, who inspires me, I think that I am most inspired by um, who inspires me, okay. I think I'm most inspired by people who do things differently, um, people, who, um, people who venture out of their comfort zone, um, people who uh, take risks and uh, some, some sort of travel the roads less traveled uh, as it is. You know, people who are prepared to give it a shot, you know, people who are not afraid. I think that's, that's, really, that's really what gets me going. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank and you. there are loads of people around, uh, around us like that. There, there, there are some amazing role, role models, examples around us. Wow, thank you. I'm seeing so many messages. Uh, Femi is an authentic creative to the crazy ones. Now that's why you're unique in your creativity. Someone said the Lego Sled Affair is, must be you know, a study case. And it's an example of um, <coughs> perseverance and creativity, and I can't remember anything else I read because there were so many messages. I'm going to try and read more of them as we keep going, but all I can say is everyone is loving, absolutely loving what you say. Thank and they're you. all going crazy looking at your website <laughs> and loving your bags. So I think you're going to be flooded with orders very soon. Come here. on, bring it on. <laughs> now, could you please share with us two or three anecdotes related to challenges and opportunities that you have faced in your career or your activities, please? Um, okay, so anecdotes. I think, the, I think the first that would immediately come to mind was my experience um, in 2010. Um, so I had just rebranded um, my, my brand, <laughs> given my brand a new name and named it after myself, Femi Handbags, created a new logo, and then got invited to take, uh, to take uh, part in, in this um, accessories exhibition, Pure London. And um, so it was my very first international show, no experience, remember? And um, I was all excited, attended the show, and landed my first international orders. Um, and these orders were made by a very small boutique in the, U um, in, in the UK, but they had branches around the UK. So, I realized very quickly my, my, the, the joy and the excitement was very short-lived because I realized very quickly that landing an order was just one part of the story. Um, actually, being able to execute and implement was quite another part of the story. And that became a total nightmare um, because what I hadn't thought of, what I hadn't known at the time of, of creating the pieces was that, of course, I would get the orders and I would need to um, recreate them 
precisely the way they were seen on the shelves at the exhibition. So that was a nightmare because, of course, I had bought the leathers on a whim at Mushi Market. A lot of Nigerians listening know that's, that's the leather hub here in Nigeria. I bought those on a whim and just created the pieces without really thinking. Um, so, of course, the leathers were no longer available and Mushi Market did not, was not developed enough to meet my specifications. So I was scrambling around, but thankfully I had about, I had a three, about a three month deadline um, timeline. So I had three months in which to, at least two months in which to look for the letters. And there was a lady who, and that's another thing he taught me, build relationships. It's so, relationships are so important. Um, so I'd met this lady like a year before. So I just reached out to her and asked for help. And she helped source some of the letters. In fact, one of the letters actually, she brought, brought the letter in from um, Brazil, you know, so and that was the, a, a, that was a, a really huge um, learning curve for me at the time because I realized that um, you can't run faster than your legs can carry you. You know, you really have to take things one step at a time, you know. And I was always in a hurry. So I had to like pause, slow down and, 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 and continue the learning journey, you know. So it, it also made me appreciate better um, the, the, the international trade shows. So I started attending uh, more more trade shows. Um, and then um, another one that, that would rest, remain with me for a lifetime was when I first started out, the, I, I, I found that 90% of my customers were expatriates. And that was because that was a long time ago. And Nigerians were just not buying Nigeria. So it was very difficult for them to appreciate the work that I was doing, even though I must admit I must have been doing good work if they were being bought by the expatriates. But um, so whether I was going to a bazaar or an exhibition, I was always, always being um, flooded. Um, the expatriates always flooded around my table. And then I would find that even when I wanted to stock in a Nigerian shop, I remember a lady once who said, oh, you know what? Oh, sorry, I don't stock them. Um, I don't stock them. I only stock imported goods. And I was like, okay, no problem. <laughs> you know, but hey, here I am today. I'm still making my bags uh, you know, um, so, so that was, that, that was also, um, quite painful. And I remember that my very first stockist was a lady. She was Swede and, um, she owned this very, very popular store at the time called Quintessence. And I was in that store for over 10 years. So, um, again, it, the lesson from that was, uh, unfortunately, I think it, it probably took the recession to, to make us begin to appreciate what we have in and begin to look inwards, you know. So that has changed a lot now. I, I'm glad to, to know that. But, uh, but I also think that we, we, need to, we need to encourage each other more. We need to appreciate each other more um, in, in the continent, in the country, and, and around ourselves. Um, yeah, so that, that definitely stayed with me for a long time. Um, but I think that... I've talked about opportunities, and I guess the biggest opportunity is having um, signed a partnership with the MasterCard Foundation um, sometime last year. Um, and uh, going into going into this partnership was a was a was a huge learning experience also for us. So we've been producing um, 2.5. We're about to roll off the project now. We've been producing 2.5 million pieces of PPE and distributing to. Um, states around Lagos state or your state, you know, just about five, five or six states around, around the country. And um, that has been a phenomenal and an incredible experience. If I start talking about that, we'll never live here. So yeah, <laughs> that, that's, that, that's, that was an amazing opportunity. But well, that has been an, an amazing opportunity. Thank you. So people are asking, which African countries outside of Nigeria is your strongest market? Um, I'm not sure that we have a strongest market, but we do get uh, most orders um, come from Kenya and South Africa. Kenya and South Africa. Thank yeah. you. And someone was also asking, where is your, where are you stopped in New York? Um, so it's in, so we're stopped in Madison Avenue. Um, and that's another anecdote, <laughs> but I wouldn't go into that. But that was just um, pure luck because um, um, it, it, that happened after after a country show. So we got um, so a lady invited us to stock in her in in their boutique, and um, it's called Emel Boutique on Madison Avenue. I think the address is one zero four four Madison Avenue. So Emel Boutique one zero four four Madison Avenue in New York. Yes. 
Yes. Someone said we need you in Ivory Coast. We're coming. Good. We're, we're, we're creating our Africa strategy. So Excellent. watch this space. Ladies, you heard her. She's creating an Africa strategy and watch the space. She's coming. <laughs> now, Femi, what mm. makes you an international public speaker? And where do you get the confidence to stand there and speak? What, what makes people listen to you? Hmm. You flatter me, Nadia. <laughs> I, I definitely am not an international a, a public speaker. I don't talk less than international, an international one. Um, but yeah, I do get to speak um, quite a bit. Um, I, get, I do get invited to, to share my story. I'm not sure that I have the confidence yet to stand in front of thousands of people. So maybe I should head to Gori Island and take, and take some lessons from, from you and Jill. Um, so that, I, but um, I, I, I've just always been a, a behind the scenes kind of girl. So, and you know, like I said, this is my first IG live, you know, my friends make fun of me, but it is my first IG live. Um, yeah, so, but I think that, um, I think that the reason people listen to me is that I, I have a story to tell. Um, and I have, and it, it's pretty fascinating because, you know, we've just told that story, a, a, a story of a thousand miles in, in two minutes, you know, but there's, there's, there's so much. Um, because I think they're fascinated by what I have to say. Um, and, but beyond being fascinated, they're also very inspired by it. And, um, I also know that by, by sharing my stories, my experiences, by sharing the difficulties I've been through, by sharing the, the wins, by sharing the, the failures, by, sh by sharing everything, uh, it, it's, it's much easier for people watching or, or aspiring to resonate with, with those stories and believe that, well, if she can do it, you know, I, I can too. So I, I've, I've realized that and I, I, I try to share more um, because I know that it, it, it encourages, it helps to encourage people, especially those coming, coming from behind us and, and proves, like I said earlier, that by persevering, um, you can achieve so much and you can, you can do more and you can be more. So, yeah. Well, someone is saying, Femi, lose the imposter syndrome. Your story is authentic, has inspirational teaching points, and resonates with many. That's Catherine. Okay. Hi, Catherine. I love Hi, Catherine. Very, yeah. very generous. <laughs> and uh, Le Ninja is saying, yes, EDC have been part of that story, and we are so yes. proud of you. Thank you, Nana. Thank you, Neka. <laughs> Catherine was also asking, where can we find your pieces in London? Oh, Catherine, don't be so impatient. Just wait. <laughs> We're coming. Okay. We're come coming. To London too. You're gonna get we just want, we need, plan, my lady. We need to get it right. You know, we're working on building our capacity and, um, we're going to ensure that when we start um, expanding, we don't we do not fail, and that's that's very very important. So yeah, so we're taking our time to do it right. Excellent. What advice would you like to give your our audience on design, entrepreneurship, and public speaking, for me? Um. So I would say. Um, I would say the first piece of advice I think I would give is whether, so whether you're a designer, whether you're an entrepreneur, um, whether you're a public speaker, of which I hope to be one day, um, as the case may be, um, I think the, the key is to be being authentic. You know, I think that you need, we all need to create a, a unique, uh, a unique selling point that stands us out from the crowd. Um, and you, we, we need to package our brands such that they, become recognizable you know we need to build those brands we need to develop those brands um those brighter identities and then when we build them we don't just leave them we water them we nurture them um and i think that it's very important that as we go along we must we must ensure that the, the brand message the, our brand message is, is consistent all the time so that we do not uh, confuse our audience i remember um many many years ago when people were saying oh you know what femi your bags are too colorful 
you know, why don't you make us back black bags? You know, why don't, why don't you tone your colors down and all that? But I really did enjoy designing them. And today is that particular char- characteristic that has, um, that, that has helped strengthen, uh, the brand, the brand aesthetic. And, and so for me, it's, there's nothing wrong with feedback. Um, because we do thrive on feedback at, at Femi handbags. Um, we listen to what our customers are saying, but it's also important that we find the right balance. It's important that um, we don't dilute the essence of who we are, of who, what our brand is, and you, you don't dilute you. So, you know, you keep, keep doing you um, and don't try to fit in. You know, um, it's more problematic when we're trying to fit into a certain, a certain box. So I think that we really should just give, give our imagination the, the, the wings to fly. Because at the end of the day, what really sets us apart is that, is that unique thing about us. And then I think also, and I have learned from experiences, you know, that um, we need to also develop um, 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 a growth mindset, you know, and not think small. So, yeah, there's nothing wrong with starting small. And some people do advise it's important to start small. But, uh, you know, think big. Because if you, start, if, you, if you think small, you stay small. Um, and um, I, I love this quote by Arist- Aristotle, you know, the, the Greek philosopher who says, so whether you think you can, you definitely can. And whether you think you can't, you definitely can't. So because in a way you can't because you've already limited, you've already limited yourself with, with very small thoughts. And um, another quote from um, Aristotle, you know, um, I had a, a Greek philosopher as a, as a dad. Um, is it is not because things are difficult that we do not dare. It is because we do not dare um, that they are difficult. And I completely agree with that. So whatever the industry that we are in, I don't think that taking a few risks will hurt um, anybody. Um, I don't think that stepping out of your comfort zone will hurt. You you can only learn, and every 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 challenge that you face. Every failure is, as far as I'm concerned, a learning, a learning experience. So let's see the lessons. Uh, let's see the cup half full and not, uh, not half empty. And I truly believe that um, you can only grow if you are mentally, if you truly are mentally prepared, prepared to grow. And then, but I think most importantly, and I say this all the time, is to fully understand the nitty gritty of your industry. You know, the strategy, the value chain, the opportunities, the weaknesses, the strengths, um, the, you know, um, a long time ago, I learned this word Kaizen and I held on to it. It's a Japanese word that means um, continuous learning. And that's what I've done. You know, I've continued to learn and, you know, dig and dig and dig. Um, you know, so we need to keep learning. We need to take the time to reflect so that we can be crystal clear as to where we're going um, and how we plan to get there. Now, having said that, it's not always easy. And I'm a fantastic example of a slow learner. Um, I, 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 I figured it out. It took me years and years and years um, to figure it out. But um, as creatives and as uh, entrepreneurs, design entrepreneurs, we must never forget um, that we have a business to run. So we need to work on the design just as much as we work on. The, I mean, we need to work on the business just as much as we work on the on the on the design. You know, because like I always say, um, success. Uh, is 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. Not my words. I found them somewhere. <laughs> and yeah, so that, that, that's it. Isn't she just awesome? I could just be listening to you on and on and on. And <laughs> I'm going to reveal a secret. When I went to your factory in Ibadan, and I saw all these quotes on the walls to inspire your team. It was just so marvelous. What an awesome lady. Now everybody knows why we're your fans. And one of your biggest fans is <laughs> sending a lot of hearts through. Oh, oh who's world. that? <laughs> oh, I will reveal his name. It's Gilles Aconi. <laughs> ah, Gilles. Yes. Thank you, Gilles. Absolutely. absolutely. Femi, we're coming to the end of this talk, unfortunately. <laughs> Any final thought or messages you want to share with everyone? So, yes. So I knew that this would come. Um, and uh, yes, um, me, the first thing I would say is it pays to be prepared. You know, I have found that luck or fortune, like they say, uh, favors the prepared. Um, and I do believe that when you're able to think ahead, um, no matter how difficult things are, 
um, no matter how difficult things, things, no matter how things may be falling apart, um, you just keep doing, just keep showing up, um, keep putting those little structures in place, however basic, you know, so that um, when the opportunities come our way, we will be, we will be ready to grab them with, with both hands. Um, if someone had said to me way back then that I would be partnering with the, with one of the largest NGOs, um, in the world, MasterCard Foundation, I probably have, I mean, a few years ago, I probably have asked them if they were smoking something, you know, but, um, the opportunity did arise for us and, um, we were, we were ready to, to grab that, that opportunity. So I would say be prepared. Um, and then another thing that I would say is, um, and again, my, my years in business have taught me that, that um, as you build your business, um, as you build your brand, um, remember also, just keep it at the back of your mind that you're building an audience, invisible or not, um, because you just don't know who's paying attention, you don't know who's watching you, and you don't know when that phone call will come. You don't know when that person, that, that, that angel is going to walk through the door, you know, so choose excellence above all else and just, just do it right. The best, the best way you can. And um, finally, um, and this is very important. Uh, my final message would be don't wait for everything to be perfect. Um, it never, never is. There, there will be bends in the road. You will have to jump through hoops. We will hit roadblocks as entrepreneurs um, but we need to just keep at it. We need to just keep believing. Um, we manage our expectations. Definitely, please do that as we go along. Um, but nevertheless, just keep move, moving and keep the end goal in mind. So really, I would just say, just start. Start where you are. Use what you have. Um, do what you can. Um, you have the tools right here in your hands. The good book says that the talent of a man, the, 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 the talent of a man will make way for him. And he will make way. He always does. You know, so just go ahead and do it afraid and figure it all out as you go along. Trust me, you're, you're sure to find gold at, at the end of the road. Wow, 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 wow. Amazing. Just amazing. Everybody's talking about the wonderful advice. You are so inspiring. So many okay. arresting small gems of phrases. Femi, what can I say? You are Thank you, Nadia. Awesome. It is the truth. Thank I, you. I mean, Jill and I have been saying it, but now this is our audience talking about it and saying wise words and thanking you and, you know, you are fantastic. Thank you so much. Now, Thank I have you. To tell Thank you. you. London is begging for you to come. <laughs> So you need to make London, we're coming. <laughs> so is Abidjan. So there is now a competition between London and Abidjan. But I've seen Paris sending requests as well. So dear friends, until Femi is actually um, in stores in one of your cities, make sure you go online. Look at her website, place your orders, and you will receive your beautiful bag. I can tell you that for sure. Until then, I want to announce our next speaker, an international British Nigerian lawyer, chairman of the Africa Center in London, Oban Sube, will be our next guest speaker next Thursday. Same place, same time. Make sure you are there because that gentleman is something else. He is an absolutely amazing lawyer. He has made so many lists of, you know, high potential, top notch African black in the UK and around the world. You want to hear his story too. But until then, Femi Olaevi, thank you. Thank you, Nadia, for having me. Thank such you. Such a beautiful talk. Thank you to everyone who attended today. It was lovely to have you with us. And see you next week. Stay safe. Stay blessed. Bye bye. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.